So I'm really excited today to kind of break away from all the news. So I'm currently the managing editor at Daily Hive, and we've been pumping out news stories like crazy on everything that's happening across Canada and across the US. So it's really nice for me to kind of step away for a second and go back to what I was doing with Prest and just chat with you about how I ran my company for three years from starting it to selling it. Um, please interrupt me anytime with questions. So this is me. Um, so again, I'm currently the managing editor at Daily Hive. Prior to that, I ran a startup called Press News for three years. We made the news easy to understand for young people. I graduated from Western with a media degree and then spent about 10 years working in ad agencies and then moved over to the corporate side and worked at Loblaws, then Sportsnet, then ended my career helping Rogers Media launch the Viceland TV channel. So a lot of my time was spent in media, but I actually wanted to be an event planner, which is funny because I never actually ended up doing any event planning at all in my career. But um, now, I'm, uh, now I'm in media through and through. So why did I start a company? I actually grew up not wanting to start a company ever. I thought entrepreneurship was way too hard. My parents have their own small business, so I grew up really feeling like this is not the world for me. I want to climb the corporate ladder. I want, I want benefits. And then as I started climbing the corporate ladder, I really started to feel like my creativity was being stunted. And I really just wanted to wake up on Mondays happy and excited to go to work. And it was really at Rogers when I started, I loved working there and it is an amazing place to learn. But every time I had an idea that I wanted to execute, I would inevitably get stopped at one of the 10 different levels that I had to get through. And so I had this idea that I wanted to, um, to work on called Pressed. It was, again, this, this like content news digital platform. Um, I did end up pitching part of the idea to Rogers and it just never went through. So I ended up quitting my job and starting it on my own. Um, so this is what it was called. The, the girls at the top is everyone who worked on it. And essentially, again, it was a content media platform. We sent out a daily newsletter of the top five world news stories of the day, um, but it was written out in a way that made sense. So it was written out in a way that was conversational and we removed all the newsy jargon and just made it easy to understand. Again, we had a weekly podcast that did something similar as well as online explainers um, that we called cheat sheets that we would produce for every major event like an election. And we distributed a lot of our content on social media and that's where we got most of our organic new followers. So what I wanted to do was go through the three years um, one by one on the things that I did versus the things that I wish I had done. Um, but I do want to preface that by saying that looking back, there's definitely mistakes that I've made. Um, but also I know that with the limited knowledge that I had back then, I probably would have made the same decision. So I'm sure there's lots of people here who are running a business or thinking about running a business. So that's all I would say is that be really forgiving of yourself when you make mistakes. So in my first year, what I did, so I quit my full-time job at Rogers. It sounds easy, but it took three agonizing months of back and forth before I finally um, took the leap. I worked a couple of freelance jobs to manage those expenses, but I also had some savings left that before I quit my job, I calculated how long I could last. I calculated that I, my finances could last me about a year if I used up my savings and also freelance worked. Um, I pitched myself to get media coverage. There's a star beside this because, again, looking back in the last three years, this is something that um, I would encourage and tell every startup founder to do. Um, it doesn't cost any money. It takes time, but it is so valuable. This is where we got our first like hundreds, thousands of um, new followers. Um, I should also mention that Press was a B2C company. So the way that we promoted ourselves versus a B2B company would be 
would probably be a little different. Um, in my first year, we really focused on growing our audience because again, as a BDC company and a content company, we couldn't sell ads or any sponsorship campaigns or make revenue until we had a large enough audience. So that was our, our main focus. Uh, and again, because I didn't have any money, we onboarded students and volunteers to work with us, which um, you'll discover is not actually that easy to do because a lot of schools don't actually offer volunteer options. So that in itself took a bit of time, but when we were able to get the students on board, it was really valuable to us in our first year. Um, I also researched and joined the startup community. Startup communities like Startup Here TO, like Civic Tech TO, were so valuable in helping me figure out um, how to navigate um, the whole space. I didn't even know that the community existed, uh, but when I found it, um, I was so grateful for it. What I should have done that I missed was the competitive analysis. Of course, I knew who our competitors were and I knew what they were doing well and what they weren't, but I didn't really dig deep into how they were making money, how they got their followers. Um, I think part of it was a little bit of ego, thinking that, oh, I have this great idea that obviously I can make better, but part of it I think was also fear, thinking that, oh no, what if they did something that didn't work that I'm doing now, and then feeling like I had already taken the leap out of my job. So there were so many reasons why I didn't, also competitive analyses take a lot of time, so obviously that's why too, but looking back, that's definitely something that I would have dug deeper um, into for sure. So in my second year, we ran out of money, so we had to raise money, because um, that's what you're supposed to do as a startup, raise money, right? And again, it's written on here like it was super easy, but it was actually so hard to raise money, um, as I'm sure some of you already know. I'm happy to answer some questions, like some more detailed questions about how I went about that, if you'd like. I do not come from a wealthy background. I don't have an uncle with a fund. I had to really hustle to raise this money. Um, I also joined a startup accelerator that came with money. And again, looking back, I wouldn't even have applied for accelerators that didn't come with money because how hard it is to get in um, and how much you need that capital from the beginning. I joined an accelerator called Communitech Fierce Founders. This is for women only. There is a boot camp that's two weeks, and then there's an accelerator that comes with a Ontario government grant that matches the money that that matched the money that I raised. So altogether, um, that pool of money lasted would have lasted me another year and helped me and enabled me to hire people as well. So in that second year. Um, we had that six month accelerator. And during that time, it was a lot of discovery, of course, but we also applied for any and all grants, investments, and pitch competitions. We used the money to hire writers. And I continued to pitch myself to media coverage. And I started to participate as a speaker at events. This is another tip that I got from a mentor that I think is valuable to all founders, whether you're a B2C or B2B company, is put your face on your business and put your face on your brand. As soon as I started putting my face um, on our brand, on our social media, we got so many more followers and also so much more engagement on our content. In the early stages of your company, I find that um, people want to support you even if they don't know you. They're really rooting for the human behind it. Um, and then we continue to focus on audience, audience growth through word of mouth tactics, such as speaking at events. So what I wish I did was we use a lot of, I use a lot of that money that we raise to hire writers and to hire people. I think a lot of people do that. They raise money and then hire people because they're so burnt out from doing everything on their own. For me, looking back, um, I would have used that money to grow our audience instead. We probably could have gone another year using volunteers and student journalists, and I could have probably gone another year doing the brunt of the work uh, because 
I found that trying to get our organic growth was much harder than doing like the content work that we hired people to do. Um, and as I mentioned, we use a ton of time applying for all and every grant investment and pitch. I definitely, definitely looking back would not have done that. Again, I would have focused on the, the ones that we thought we had a really good chance at um, or just things that came with money um, or just did some more research on the investors behind some of these projects before we did, we took all that time with the applications and we would have, I would have spent that money testing revenue streams. This world of growing your audience before you make money thing is not a thing anymore. Um, so that's definitely something I would have went back and done. Am I talking too fast or rambling? We're good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in my second half of my last year of this company, I stopped applying for the grants and investment, mostly because I was just sick of getting rejected. Um, if we focused on sales and client development because we needed to keep making, bringing money into the company. So if I were to break out sort of our finances in the three years, the first year was savings. The second year was our investment. And then the third year was let's make money as a company. We focused on that and we brought in money to keep us afloat for six months before just I personally burnt out. Again, I continue to push myself to get media coverage. That was still working, so that's a check. Kept participating at speaker events because so many people discovered Pressed through, through that. And I continue to focus on audience growth. But I did all of this way too late. Um, I wish that I had discovered that <laughs> the, I wish I had discovered the mistakes I was making probably in my second year. If we had started doing this in our second year, we probably would have been able to continue for much, much longer. Um, yeah. So after our third year is sort of when things started to feel too hard. It started to feel, um, I started waking up reading blogs about when to close your startup. Just like I needed someone to tell me whether it was time or not. It was a really, really, really tough decision. Um, but in November of last year, our team made the difficult decision to shut down. Um, it was a really hard conversation with investors, but everyone was really supportive. Our writers and our employees cried. It was just so awful. Um, but this story ends with, um, there's a happy ending to this story. We, in January, were acquired by Daily Hive. So it's kind of a, it was weird how it all happened because, so I mentioned pitching yourself to media and networking and speaking at events a million times. I really think that in the end, that really helped us get here. So after we closed, after we made the announcement that we closed in November, we were approached by like hundreds of our readers with their gratitude, but also dozens of people who reached out saying, do you need a job? Um, do you need this? Like, how can I help you? And we ended up getting three acquisition offers. So obviously these acquisition offers um, at that point, we didn't have enough leverage to say, I want a million dollars, right? So it's not quite the outcome that we wanted, um, but still, we were very grateful to get those offers. Um, in the end, we decided to sell the Daily Hive because it came with a cash offer. Plus, um, I part of the acquisition was me going to Daily Hive as their managing editor. And we got this great story out of it. And it, was, uh, it was a happy moment, but also very bittersweet because it really marked the ending of it all. In November, when we closed down, I think um, a lot of our team was hoping that somehow we could be revived. Uh, but this really marked the, the ending of it, but it kind of sealed everything with a bow. Um, yeah, so I skipped over this slide really quickly, but these are the lessons that, that I learned. Three really easy ones. Focus on revenue early. Notice what's not working and pivot quickly. And pitching yourself to media is worth the time. Learn how to do it. 
um, meet up with friends who are in PR to figure out who you should be pitching to. It's totally worth it. And that's all I got. Thanks everyone for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, round of virtual applause uh, for Jacqueline here. <laughs> Thanks guys. Thank you, awesome. Can I answer any questions for anyone? Um, let me, should I exit my screen share? Uh, you can keep it up or, okay. uh, yeah, in case people want to see something else again. Uh, sure. If you have a question, uh, you can just kind of pop a Q, like the letter Q in the chat, and we'll call on you. All right, uh, Rose first. Rose, if you can use your um, mic. Yes. Hi. Hi. I muted myself like totally three <laughs> times. Um, so I'm Rose. Um, so I reached out to you, Jacqueline, for, from Female Co-Founder. Um, so I just wanted to say hi. Um, hi. Hi. Um, so my question is that um, since uh, your uh, since Prescott acquired from, da uh, from Daily Hive, like, do you have another plan to um, any other future plans in um, starting another startup similar to press or any future plans in doing anything in that sense? Yeah, so the reason, another reason why we chose Daily Hive is because, and they chose me, is because they're revamping their email strategy right now. And it was a really valuable acquisition for them um, that included me as well and, and my experience with press. So there's no plans on reviving press exactly, but um, I definitely have plans to incorporate some of the things that we did with press at Daily Hive. Um, in terms of whether I want to start a company again, the answer is yes, but I think that I'm still feeling really bruised from the whole thing and I need some time to recover, but I definitely see myself starting again with like all of the things that I learned. Thank you. You're welcome. Actually, maybe I'll put it out there. Um, I'm actually really interested in male fashion. And so if anyone's starting a startup in male fashion, I'd love to just like pick your brain and chat with you about it. Awesome. Uh, next question will be from Skydra. Feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, hey Jacqueline, this is great. Hi. Thanks for honestly being vulnerable about your failures. I think that's something that like everyone should feel comfortable doing because we all make mistakes and we can all learn from them. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I want to say like, just personally, I used to read press news all the time. I was such a huge fan. I loved how like plain language it was. And I'm really looking forward to mm -hmm. seeing more of that trickle over. Um, kind of like uh, an, a question related. So bullet news, I imagine was another company that was like, we're doing similar work. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if, um, like for those of you who don't know, Bullet News is also a daily newsletter, um, but they do uh, weekend uh, consumption reads as well. Was wondering like if you ever had conversations with Bullet, um, like what kind of relationship did you have with, I guess with companies that were doing very similar work? Like would you be collegial? Would you sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> like what does oh, that man. dynamic kind of look like? As, as oh, much man. as you feel comfortable sharing. You're really putting me on the spot. So I'm, Okay, so I'm an open book, but I don't want to throw anyone under the bus. Um, so I will say that uh, there are a couple companies in Toronto who started around the same time as us that were similar. So I'll, I'll talk about the positive ones first. Um, the gist is a similar idea, but only sports. <clears throat> so we, it was challenging because uh, they started much later than us and they would ask us things that I felt like maybe we shouldn't share as much. But in general, I felt like um, myself and their founders worked really well together. We helped each other, each other as much as we could. And when we saw each other at events, we would truly genuinely wish each other luck at pitch competitions and stuff. Um, I didn't have a relationship with the Bullet founders at all. We've spoken at an event um, together once um, and otherwise didn't ever speak again. And that's all I'll say about that. 
All right, thank you. Uh, next question uh, will be from Katrina. Feel free to unmute yourself. Hi, Katrina. Katrina and I are old friends from Sportsnet. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, no, I remember when you were starting this journey and um, it was very bold and brilliant in many ways. And I think, um, you know, I'm curious to hear about how your audience or what did you, did, did the way that you shared your content work, like, did it resonate? Was it, what, did it come down to the audience that you weren't able to grow fast enough? Or, um, cause I feel like what you did was very much needed. And, you know, in many ways, obviously the gist is relying on its audience, um, to crave the way they speak to them mm -hmm. more than the content. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about that. And then the second part is how did you learn how to value your company when you were getting into that negotiation? Because that's yeah. a big, that's a yeah. big deal to mm -hmm. sort of go through that process and know if you're, you know, if you're valued properly or under or over or mm -hmm. what, what did that feel like to you to, to learn that really quickly? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll answer that one's an easier one because there's actually steps that I took. Okay. Um, but the harder question is the first part about um, the audience and what really ultimately uh, ended our company. So I don't think it was the audience. In the end, of course, we didn't have enough money, audience resources, right? Like all of those things. But it definitely wasn't our audience um, because our content really resonated with our audience. And to be honest, that's the only reason why we stayed alive for so long. And that, that's the only reason why we kept pushing forward. I'd say the reason why we shut down ultimately is because we had great people, but not the right people. So I took on basically anyone who would help me run the company came on. Anyone who was passionate came on. But in the end, like we faltered because it was just me who was running it full time. Um, like the gist has three people running full time. And to me, that was, that's like the biggest difference when you're starting a company with no funds and no experience, you're going to need um, all hands on deck as many people as possible. So for me, I don't think I would ever start a company again alone. I definitely would start with someone else. Everything else we can work on, but that's something definitely I wouldn't do again. Um, in valuing my company, so, so many things were involved. One thing that anyone can do now is um, we worked because of my relationship with Communitech and our accelerator, I was able to use resources from Mars and they did a whole competitive analysis for me on how competitors in the US, around the world, in Canada were valuing themselves. And I had to come to, with, um, come to them with a number, but in the end, they were able to tell me if it was fair. So I made, a, made up a number based on a few factors. So I knew that the skim was our biggest, most successful competitor in the US. Um, I was able to dig up how much money they've raised in how many rounds. Um, I was able to figure out how many users they had at the point of when they raised that amount of money. And then I basically did some simple math in terms of um, how many users we had at that point, how big our market was compared to the US, so Canada versus US, very easy. And then came to a number um, based on also how, how much we were expecting to grow within the amount of time the money was gonna be used for. Does that make sense? So I knew that I was raising money for two years, let's say. Um, and within that time, I was expecting to grow X amount. And so that's how much we, that's how we evaluated ourselves. And then with the help of Mars, they were able to say, yeah, that's around the right amount. I think also in the end, it's also you come up with a number you go to investors with, but if they say that's too high, you're going to have to reevaluate. You know, it's kind of like this, this, it's really a made up number, really. The first number you make is, is kind of made up. But those were kind of the steps I took. That's helpful, thank you so much. And You're I welcome. guess um, just a quick um, uh, part B to that is how you built your audience up to, I'm not sure how many people, um, but was that 
transferable within the sale of the company? Or were they, was there a mechanism to um, transfer that audience forward? Um, I guess the, the question comes to mind because I was part of the uh, Canadian Women's Hockey League when it folded. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of great audiences built up that just sort of went went dark um, pretty quickly mm -hmm. because the entity didn't exist anymore. But mm -hmm. I still, you know, often think about all the work that went into building up all those audiences and yeah. different markets. And and what do you, what kind of options do you have as, um, you know, someone who, who has built that up in terms of how you move it forward? Yeah, sure. Um, I can't share the number of our audience because it's been sold now. And that's, um, so I can't share that number, unfortunately. But um, here's a good, a good tip is that your social media following, if you have um, like a good amount of followers on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, there are, gen there are usually companies looking just to buy you out, um, just to buy those followers from you so that they can transfer it to their audience if it's similar. And so for us, it was like, that was easy. So the social media piece was easy. We were just transferring it because Daily Hive and Press basically have the exact same audience demographic. Um, most of our audience though is in emails. And because of the way the law is structured in Canada, we can't just pass over our email list to Daily Hive, that's illegal. Um, but what we will do is I'm gonna send a personal email to the press email list and our audience letting them know sort of what happened with Prest and like the transfer to Daily Hive and then give them the option to sign up for all the Daily Hive email lists. So that's what we'll do. And it'll just be, and it'll have to be up to the readers. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, awesome. Um, if you're okay with two last questions, because uh, mm -hmm. I promised we would, uh, we've got two on the chat here. So the first one um, is, do, do, do. Uh, in your opinion, what was the main issue, issue, the mistakes you made as a first-time entrepreneur or something about the content industry itself that made your idea or model, model um, not live up to its full potential? Yeah. Um, so I, I think the first part I kind of answered with Katrina's question, which is, I don't think we had, I think we had great people, but not the right people. Um, that was our first mistake. Our second big mistake was as when we, after we raised money, was spending that money hiring people that weren't right, weren't the right people, instead of um, using it to grow users. Um, sorry, what was the second part of that question? Um, was the was the issue around it, uh, like the content industry itself? Oh, or something else? Yeah, um, that's a really good point. Actually, the media industry itself doesn't have any money right now, and everyone is trying to figure out how to make that money. And so there's so many stories I can tell, but one that really sticks out is one of the accelerators we applied for in New York was supported by Washington Post and New York Times. And they ended up folding, the accelerator ended up folding because the funds coming from these media companies start, stopped coming in. And so how can new media companies exist if the old ones can't support themselves? So it wasn't, to me, I thought, well, we're creating innovation in a dying industry, so maybe we can help revive it. Um, but I don't, I think the timing was a little bit off uh, for people to put money into media. Okay, yeah, thank you. And then the last question um, from Matthew is, were the volunteers and interns that helped build the initial following of the newsletter involved in that acquisition? What, do you, what does that mean? Um, I think, uh, Matthew, if you wanna, Or uh, uh, sorry, yeah, no. Um, you met, you mentioned earlier that uh, when you first started, you know, there was a lot of volunteers, there was interns um, that were kind of helping with writing the newsletter. Um, you know, just involved with, with the company. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious how um, far along they were carried, and um, you know, if I mean, I know that the company was acquired in the end. Um, so I'm just curious because. Volunteering for a for-profit company seems like an odd uh, position to be in to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious how that come how that plays out. Mm -hmm. So um, it really depended on who. I think you're asking if they ended up getting equity in the company, right? So for so it depended on who was coming in. Um, a lot of the volunteers we took on actually had to do an internship as part of their credits. 
So that was easier. As soon as we made the two year mark, it was one year mark. I can't remember for some schools, it's different one or two year mark. You can apply for interns for four months as part of their credit. Um, and then we paid them a stipend. Uh, and then we did have volunteers. So our first managing editor wasn't getting paid, but she had a significant amount of equity in the company. Um, but we wrote it in the contract so that it had to be um, earned. I forgot what the word is, but it had to be earned over a certain amount of time. Um, and it ended up that that didn't happen. So the only people who had equity at the time of our acquisition was myself, our investor, and our investors. All right, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your honesty. Thank you for uh, uh, walking us through this from start to finish uh, sort mm -hmm. of journey. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, can they reach out to you on Twitter perhaps or mm -hmm. anywhere else? You can message me on LinkedIn, add me to LinkedIn, DM me. Yeah. yeah. All right. And I think her details are, details are still on the meetup group. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you.